What's going on, everybody? And welcome to another episode of Ask a P. So this is a companion podcast to the other side of the firewall podcast, where we talk to those movers, shakers, and glass cylinder breakers, those people of color who made to the other side of the proverbial firewall. Uh, with Ask a P, uh, what I like to do is I like to interview somebody who is in the industry or someone who is uh, looking to join the industry or it's just a different vibe, right? It's a conversation to get to know somebody and then uh, also to introduce them to the uh, the audience. So uh, I have the, the pleasure of having a, uh, a special guest on for uh, for this week. So it's been a while. I think it's been like two or three weeks since I've had a guest on. So I'd like for you to uh, introduce yourself, give us a little bit of your background, and then we'll jump right into your cybersecurity origin story. Fantastic. Well, thanks for having me on the show today, Ryan. Really appreciate it. Um, my name is Kane McGladry. I am the field CISO for Hyperproof, and I am also a senior member of the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers, that's the IEEE, for contributions to cybersecurity. Um, I like to say that I've been doing this for over 25 years because that makes me sound younger than I possibly am. <laughs> it's kind of one of those things. Um, what else can I say about myself? I am a multiple time CISO. Uh, most recent time was with the Defense Industrial Base, which is a whole side story there. And I'm based out of Bellingham, Washington, up in the far Pacific Northwest, where we have more breweries than we have grocery stores. Okay. Uh, that I did not know. That's an interesting fact, actually. Uh, and so that kind of gives me a good pivot. So uh, I, I think you left out, you're, you're being humble, right? You left some stuff out. So uh, in addition to all of what you just said, you have a really good podcast that I actually listen to. Uh, and people know I don't like to necessarily get a lot of material from somebody before I talk to them, right? I like for it to be like brand new, just like I'm an audience member. But I really do like uh, the one segment that you have. It's uh, drafting compliance, I believe. Oh, yes. Title. Yep. Yep. I've, I've had to tell my friends that I drink beer at work and they ask me what's <laughs> what, what's so bad about that. And I have to remind them I'm not a beer drinker. Um, before the show, actually, I was out shopping at my local beer store um, where I was had a picture of another CI, uh, another CISO's refrigerator. And I was like showing them like, so here's the beer, like, which of these do you have? And that tends to be the show production process, um, which is a weird way to produce a podcast, like show up at a store and be like, here's a picture of somebody's beer selection. Tell me what you have. Um, but it's a fun show. Uh, we're now getting into episode 20 and it's about FedRAMP. So if you want to learn about why you probably don't want to do FedRAMP or why you'd like more grayer hair in your life, it's you go. good in both ways. <laughs> So yeah, I'll definitely be tuning in for that one, like, because uh, 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 people know my background, uh, military, right? So retired military, uh, 20 years Air Force, uh, FedRAMP and uh, CMMC, all that good stuff was, uh, and it was there and then it wasn't there and then it was being built and then it was being, uh, you know, refreshed. So now we've come to a place where it's like, hey, it's time. <laughs> it is go time. So podcasts like yours and, and just be able to uh, provide that information, uh, especially like I like you guys' format, right? Like, so we're pretty short as well, 15 minutes or less. Uh, then, we, you know, we have some side tangent, things of that nature. But I think like uh, I, I, I'm inspired by your, your timing and the, the theme of the show. So I think it really works out really well. It's entertaining and keeps people engaged. So I definitely want you to, to plug all your things on the podcast as well, right? I, like make sure well, I also think that cybersecurity really does need to be more accessible for people um, wherever they are on the spectrum of career or engagement with cybersecurity, because for too many years, we've had this perception often driven by a media narrative that um, cybersecurity is the domain of cis white men in hoodies. And I finally like at least figured down why hoodies, I was talking to a, a friend of mine and she explained to me like, the reason she wears a hoodie to work at, at her office is it's so cold in there. And it's like, okay, finally I get the hoodie thing. I don't own a hoodie, um, yeah. but I can totally get the vibe. But there's been that just that continuous media narrative that this industry is very hands-on keyboard. It's very technical. It's very, um, it, it, it takes a high degree of uh, education to attain those roles. And then you look at, you know, we've been doing this for, well, I've been at this for 25 years. You look at the resulting um, gap in terms of diversity, in terms of socioeconomic right. backgrounds of individuals. And I can't help but feel we've been doing something wrong because if we weren't doing what we've been doing and communicating in our ways that we have been, we probably wouldn't find ourselves in the current state we're in. Right. No, absolutely. And uh, again, like, so I, I'm glad that you you decided to reach out to be on the uh, the show. 
um a, a because you just gave me a practical reason for the hoodies which i, I did not think about like, I've, I've worked help desk right within a a, a a focal point like so it's freezing in there yeah it's yep. not everywhere though that would make sense right as opposed to the, the like you said the cis white male in a hoodie in his basement you know for some reason he's in the dark while he's yeah. doing his nefarious things <laughs> in cyber um so now okay got you hoodies because it's cold and i i, I accept it <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it lot. makes it makes more sense than anything else, honestly. Then uh, I just wish that you know the, the, the way I also look at it is if we can just catch that one guy. Obviously, cybersecurity is fixed, right? It is it, it, very true. <laughs> uh, it is always the same moniker. So uh, a little housekeeping. So I want to make sure everybody uh, understands. So uh, you reached out uh, to be on the podcast. I overwhelmingly accepted. Uh, it took a while for us to get here. Just wanted to make sure that uh, I was not doing anything. Um, that would, uh, you know, put my employer in a bad space or put you in a bad space because you guys have a a partnership. It has nothing to do with me, right? So I'm, podcast is independent. Uh, we're not doing any marketing deals. You're not paying me to be on here. I really do like your product, and I do want to get into that as well. Um, but it, it's all it's it's all free. <laughs> it's just you paying with your time and me me uh, here to listen to fanboy out about it, right? Um, so <laughs> that's mutual uh, in that case, which is fantastic. I because I love what you're doing. And I, I do think we knew, we, as I said at the top, we need more diverse voices as part of our conversation. Yes, a absolutely. And yeah, the, the numbers are, are still pretty staggering, right? When I started the podcast uh, almost three years ago, where 7% were, were people of color, uh, maybe uh, I want to say it was less than 20% were, uh, were women in, in cybersecurity and both have grown, but not to the, to the extent that we would like, right? And uh, we just talked about uh, stats in Canada uh, last week where they're having an issue uh, with uh, first getting women into cybersecurity and then uh, retaining them, right? And we're just talking about how when you, when you think Canada, you think like America's cousin, right? Like it's it's like America, but the diet is better, <laughs> right? Like they, they they vacation for longer, but now they have the same issues that we have, right? So it's it's really interesting uh, to, to see that. But no, I'm, I'm glad that you're on. So two things I have to ask. Uh, number one, we're going to go into your cybersecurity origin story. But number two, I see various variations of CISO. So if you can break down field CISO for, for me in the audience. Oh, sure. So we'll, we'll start with the easy question, the field CISO bit. So um, it's uh, the way we've structured it. I am functionally a CISO, but I'm primarily outward facing. Um, I also, you've seen Tom on drafting compliance. He does a lot of the heavy lift policy internal governance work. And then we have a third individual who's actually responsible for implementation. And that's really modeled on something we saw a few years back, actually, the FinTech down in Atlanta, where, as they described it, they had the, you know, they had the person who they could put in front of the board, who they could put in front of the media, who they could put in front of the customer or prospect, or whatever, um, somebody who was very policy for focused and policy oriented and somebody who was very technically oriented as well. Uh, in terms of other disambiguation, we've seen the title of deputy CISO um, because there's this recognition finally in business. And I do hope, especially in light of the most recent SEC guidance, as well as what New York State's doing with um, uh, Section 500, the second amendment that they're putting in, there's more of a, a recognition that no CISO can do everything like i've seen CISO job listings right. that say you have to be able to write python code and you have to be able to do incident response and you have to be able to report to the board and manage a multi-million dollar budget and you go there's no there's no single person that does that and so the intent of the field CISO is really to have that outward facing um, view on the world that engagement with the world but also in, in correlation and in partnership with those other individuals in my company where we're you know we're all rowing the boat in the same direction Okay, no, that's that's a, a very good description, and uh, yes, I, I think you are right. That evolution of saying that you can't do everything, uh, we I wish that would trickle down to entry level and, and mid level as well. Uh, oh boy, yes, a lot of audience members who uh, are frustrated by the process, right? Like we want you to be entry level, but we also want you to have a CISP and ten years of experience, right? Like these things just don't jive; they don't they don't make sense. So it's good to see us if it starts at the top, you think it would trickle down uh, eventually. So. There, there's hope. Is, is basically. I, I do hope so. Although you you missed on that job description, for you also need a purple heart and thirty years of Cali Linux. 
I saw that on a job description for an internship paying $15 an hour. And I'm like, okay, so HR has over rotated into risk management here, um, right. which based on my own experience with uh, getting into cybersecurity to your other, to your other question, um, let's see, I am a, a theater major dropout. Um, that is the best way to describe it. I, uh, t- I tell my kids quite regularly, the only reason that I am where I am today is I dropped out of college. Uh, after one semester of theater, realizing that there was absolutely no way that I was going to be able to pay my rent, that there was just like that my, the odds of me getting to Broadway and doing musical theater, which was my thing, um, were approximately zero or perhaps, perhaps less than zero. There was just no real path forward for me. And so I took a lot of what I learned about improv and improv my way into a consulting gig at a startup. I was employee number four and um, just read everything that I could read, knowing full well, first of all, the the president of the company, the founder was uh, fantastically cheap and we did government contracting, uh, which is just the perfect combination. And so he was willing to take a chance on me as somebody with no prior background in security or necessarily in computers, who had um, you know the the aptitude, the willingness to learn, but also the recognition that I could accept a lower amount of pay than what the market rate was. And I think that um, you know if I if I look on now from the years since where I've worked across various industries, that motion is unfortunately changing. Like you said, there's a lot of these entry level positions that have overly onerous requirements that by no means would I have met. And I feel fortunate for what I've accomplished as a result. Uh, I I won't say it's been easy at all the time of having to learn literally everything. Like I remember one point I realized software engineering was a discipline. Apparently it's a thing they teach in school and I just, you know, I missed that whole bit. Um, I read everything that I could on it just so I could bring myself up to speed for conversations. But unfortunately, today, the emphasis we have is less about aptitude and less about intent and more about prior work and more about certifications. And um, I think that really, it, it makes it harder for people to get into to jobs that are functionally speaking, like it's, if you get a cybersecurity job, entry level, it is a middle class paying job. Um, it just straight up, straight out of the gate, you can go for two years. Actually, one of my kids is going for two years. Um, they really got good at working around the parental controls that I'd tried to deploy on their devices and Never. that didn't work. And they realized, oh, this is fun. I might be able to do offensive p- penetration testing and work around these security controls. And like, oh, this is going to be interesting. So, you know, they're, they're taking a two-year degree knowing full well that that is a path to prosperity. Um, but at the same time, they've got that ability. They've got that background. They've got a parent who was engaged and involved in cybersecurity right. who didn't necessarily like come down on them too hard for <laughs> uh, jailbreaking their own devices. And you know, rooting their own devices at times. But I don't see that as being part of the conversation anymore. And I think the over-reliance on certifications, like there's an economic cost associated with test prep and with taking, I don't know, even a boot camp, and then actually taking the certification. And that's really limiting the type of individuals who can come into cybersecurity where you already have to have a certain amount of capital just to get in the door whether it's for certification or for college education or goodness help us both. Um, and I think that that's really limited our effectiveness as an industry. Right. No, absolutely. And, and uh, so I'd, I'd like to touch on two things. So the, the thing, number one, uh, that is amazing background. Uh, and it makes sense now. Like, so I've, I've watched the podcast and you, uh, you do emote and you do have the ability to pivot very quickly. So like now that makes sense. I'm like, okay, like, uh, I can put the two together. And and that that goes along the lines of aptitude, right? Like I've talked to people who uh, have crossed over who were in law or medical or uh, their flight uh, flight um, uh, stewards or, or attendants, mm-hmm. uh, things of that nature. And they took principles from their jobs and they were able to apply it over here in cyber and IT and do uh, phenomenal things, right? Run circles around people who are just look smart people in, in the, uh, the industry, right? Um, and that is a shame that that's 
kind of gone away. Um, like not, and 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 I am optimistic, right? Like a lot of these people I met during the pandemic, so there was this big mm-hmm. shift where like the planes aren't flying, uh, the people aren't eating out, you know, uh, they're not dining and things of that nature. So I need to pivot into something. And these very smart people, you know, were able to to pick up uh, the skills necessary to find those jobs pretty quickly. And the market was open at the time, uh, mm-hmm. but since the pandemic's now over, things are starting to shift and adjust and. Uh, it's not necessarily always in in the best way. So I I do agree with you, and and hopefully more people can have your background and your story because that that's that that's amazing, right? That you're able to take those talents and bring them over here and, and do amazing things with it. I mean, I'm I'm hopeful mostly because of the veterans programs that I've had the privilege of working with and supporting over the years. Like one one of the uh, candidate pools that I have regularly drawn from when I've been hiring for cybersecurity roles is people who are veterans, because you do not have to uh, uh, explain fundamentals to them. Like, what is the mission? Why is security important? Why are we doing this? Um, and the strong combine that with a strong work ethic and a desire to learn, a lot of the um, stuff that the various community organizations and industry organizations are putting towards veterans communities to help veterans transition into cybersecurity roles. I'm hopeful for that because, you know, first of all, it's a great population that's very skilled, very motivated, very smart, talented, picks up stuff quick. I think we need to kind of as a part of a national conversation is figure out how do we expand that to include other industries from people who don't necessarily, um, who aren't veterans, but still want to get into the industry. Where is their pathway these days? And like myself, uh, liberal arts, uh, I have hired a lot of good liberal arts people too, myself having that background or (laughs) having had a try at that background. One of my favorite malware researchers I've ever hired was a, a concert violinist. Right. Like she just had absolutely no background in the in the technologies. And yet when she picked it up, her way of picking apart problems was very different than anybody else. Right. The and diversity of thought. Like that. Exactly. That's and that an aptitude and that ability to think at something differently. And I think that's something that we miss in a lot of our conversations around why we're hiring for a role is like, what do you need to be able to do? Like, if you're going to do malware research, you have to really like puzzles, right? If you're going to be in the governance side of things, you have to really like cutting through bureaucracy and succinct words, right? If you want to be in the risk management perspective, you want to have somebody who's good at talking about uncomfortable things because ain't nobody likes to talk about risk regularly. So it's these these omissions that we have where there are very talented individuals out there that could probably do that and do well at it, but we're saying, well, you need to have a CISSP. And you also need to have, you know, your offensive penetration tester certification and so on. And it, it it's not helping. Right. And I and I agree. And 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 to to flip it to, to optimistic, right? Uh, I, I think you you brought up a good point where you're able to hire people because you understand the background, how it could be applied. And I, I think we can get there. Uh, I think it's just a lot of, um, you know, the ATS system is not the greatest, right? It's 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 uh, uh, discriminating against people just based upon, you know, what whatever has been fed to it, as opposed to having a conversation with people. And once you have that conversation, things start to, to uh, solidify. So I think there's some hope there, and and uh, what we typically say it's it's not necessarily what you know, it's but it's about who you know, right? Making those connections uh, through various organizations, like you said, like uh, when it comes to veterans, you have you know four block and hire our heroes, and mm-hmm. uh, you know uh, a list of of yeah, you know, I'm probably forgetting some people where I should be uh, should be um, talking about. So I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, That's all right. There's so many good organizations out there. There are a ton of them. Like the thing is, connect with your local diva, um, veterans employment representative representative and uh you know if you're a veteran listening to the show right now you should absolutely connect with your local veterans um association or community association and find out like what opportunities are there because a lot of that tends to be free for veterans to be able to take up skilling training and like i've seen programs um out of colorado where it's 12-week program with guaranteed like employment at the end that's fantastic yes absolutely you have uh now you jog my memory you have o2o you have uh Fed VTE, like there's a lot of training. Uh, if you're thinking about, uh, you know, separation or retirement or what have you, 
and right? you want to, like you said, upskill or pivot, uh, there, there's a ton of opportunity. And they keep claiming that we have this million vacancies out there, right? So Right. Um, yeah, and, and a lot of that is self-inflicted, I think. But I will say on, on applicant tracking systems, I am hopeful based on New York's local laws that they're put in uh, this summer, actually, around... Um, use of artificial intelligence and machine learning in applicant tracking systems, because something that we found, if you look at the, the growth of generative AI and AI in general, just rabbit hole for a second here, um, we know we can audit our code for security vulnerabilities manually or automatically. We know that we can audit for um, privacy violations and compliance violations. Something that we can't audit for is for uh, ethical violations or for uh, discriminatory outcomes in the code. And so what New York State has said is, look, we're if you want to use an ATS that has some kind of machine learning, artificial intelligence, that's fine. Be prepared to publish findings on the level of discrimination and bias that that mm -hmm. is using and make that publicly available and do it annually. And I think that's fantastic because done well, if you've got resume blinding in place, if you have good guardrails in place that strip out all of the background information that protected classes should absolutely not be ranked against and yet unfortunately tend to get ranked against, right? If you strip all of that out, an ATS can do really great things. But in most cases, as you've said, it does not. It, um, it tends to perpetuate existing divisions. And I think that as we move into this world where AI is going to be doing you know, more things, some of them good, some of them not, we really do have to look at the ethical consequences of that so that it doesn't become, uh, you know, another way of perpetuating racial divides. No, absolutely. And uh, that's interesting, because I didn't know that was going through uh, New York uh, at this time, because like the EU is already pushing pretty far ahead uh, when it comes to their policy and what have you. So like, as this continuously evolves, uh, I'm becoming more optimistic and less Skynet, right? Like, because initially you're like, ah, this is not going to be good. <laughs> this is going to perpetuate, right. you know, our, our worst. Uh, but it, it, it seems as though, you know, people who uh, are smarter than me uh, and elected officials and things of that nature are actually thinking about these things and trying to do something before, uh, you know, the, the, the bad could happen, right? Like, let's figure out a way to make it uh, as equitable as, as possible. So I, I am excited about that. And it can be kind of uh, like I'm going off on a tangent. All these states with their own policies can be kind of, uh, you know, interesting, challenging when it comes to, mm -hmm. to writing policy, to, to being a, uh, a CISO, a VCSO or, or anything in between. Um, but I'm starting to, I'm kind of liking what's happening. Like, uh, I'm not going to lie. Like when it comes to like Tex Texas has their own Texas ramp and and uh, what have you. Now you, you inform me about New York. I have to look into that. Um mm -hmm as long as they can start to bridge these gaps and like, like i don't need 50 policies <laughs> but if certain states can lead the effort and then the other states can can you know join in su such as you know uh, lawmakers typically do right representative mm -hmm. from vermont and the representative from you know uh new york could you know co co-chair something i'm, I'm kind of cool with that yeah yeah, and I, I, ultimately, that would make it easier for businesses to comply with our various, like our patchwork of privacy and cybersecurity regulations. Um, where I tend to get more excited is the um, work on recognizing that if you do some form of reasonable cybersecurity, and I know that reasonable controls has been bandied about as a term before, right. but it, it makes it easier if you're a security professional recommending, hey, we should like, instead of doing the thing that Joe says we should do, why don't we follow the NIST cybersecurity framework, right? And in some states, I think it's four now, Utah, Connecticut, Ohio, and Iowa, I think it is, um, you get an affirmative tort defense. If you're doing literally any like published cybersecurity framework as a business and being able to say, wait a second, we get a, you know, we get to throw out lawsuits, tort lawsuits, if we can prove at a policy level and a procedure level, we're doing normal stuff. I think that's the recognition on the part of lawmakers that it, like cybersecurity ultimately when it comes to risk management is like tornadoes, 
right? Or like hurricanes, like you can do everything you can possibly do. You're in Florida, they have right. hurricanes yeah. there, right? right? Yeah. You can, you know, you can, you can <laughs> shore up your house, you can, you can put up sandbags to prevent flooding, you can do all the right things, and still hurricanes are going to happen. And I think in the same way in cybersecurity, we can patch our systems, we can have policies, we can educate our staff, we can have all the technical and non and procedural controls in place. And, and you know, still bad things will happen. And I think the recognition now is on lawmakers and regulators, if you made a reasonable effort, you should not necessarily be punished right. for it. I think where we're seeing, unfortunately, the other side of that regulation is that sustained failures in the market have driven certain prescriptive directives, such as the SEC's most recent guidance for public companies, where they're, they definitely want folks to you know, business a specific way, and nobody likes being told what to do. But if we'd been doing that for 20 years now, we probably wouldn't be having these conversations about what are reasonable cybersecurity controls and should the board have oversight? No, absolutely. And I'm glad you brought the, the SEC rules as well, because that, that's, again, a, a hot topic uh, and, and things are ever evolving. But I do like like uh, uh, my my co-host, uh, Shannon, says he's the Patriot guy, right? He's like, I, I get them trading in certain certain freedoms for for other things and things of that nature, but um, and this is a rabbit hole, right? I don't necessarily want to get too uh, uh, political, but uh, sometimes you have to uh, turn the screws in order to to uh, to drive these companies into making uh, smarter decisions. I, I guess I would say because at, at the end of the day, like the the risk belongs to them, and and that's just how business works. Uh, but coming from the DoD side, right, like. I, I see there's a, a huge divide, like there's actual freedom out here because uh, there's certain things where a business can make decisions uh, for budgetary reasons that in the mm -hmm. DOD space, that would be, your network would be shut down, right? Uh, and there's certain freedom in that. And I, and I get that and I, I, I do like it. However, there's certain, like sometimes regulation does have to step in to at least put up some guardrails to, to protect people. Because at the end of the day, Cybersecurity uh, defense of a private company is national defense. Like mm -hmm. it's just it all rolls up into protecting the citizenship, at least in my opinion. Yeah, and I, and I think that's one of those selling points. Again, going back to diversity and hiring and diversity and thought, we don't lean into that message enough collectively as an industry. Like we're people who want to protect our families and our friends and our companies that we work at and our customers data. And we want to, you know, we want to do the right things. So the wrong things do not happen. I think a lot of that, that tonality gets unfortunately removed from the communication of how we out really present cybersecurity as an industry. And I think that that's a failure of imagination more than anything else. If we talk about the social benefits of, of working in our industry, I think we advance the conversation far more than talking about, hey, look, we've got another zero day and there was another breach and blah, 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 blah. It just feels like the same old, same old news. We need a different approach. No, I, I completely agree with you. And and I, I think like, so uh, again, like I, I like the way that you guys do your podcast. I definitely want to get more into the, the company because I don't think we even said the name of your company, to be honest with you. So oh, Hyperproof? Like, yeah, I think I, I think I mentioned it at the top, Field CISO of Hyperproof. Okay. Uh, and and kind of what you guys, you do, what, what you guys are doing, your initiatives. Uh, and again, talk about your tools and things of that nature. Uh, because I, I, again, this is not a, a, a marketing deal. It's not uh, veiled advertising, so to speak. Like I, I'm an actual fan uh, of, of what you guys are doing and uh, how you're kind of bringing not only the, the tools uh, to the fight, but also the, uh, the the message, right? The messaging also goes with it. So definitely go ahead and kind of explain like whatever initiatives you guys have going on or anything that you want to get into as well. Sure. Sure. So the Hyperproof, you might have heard of us from our recent series, b -Rays. Um, We are a compliance automation software, uh, so the GRC space. Um, I tend to focus primarily on the risk management element. That's the whole cybersecurity CISO background there. It makes me think primarily in terms of risk. Funny that. And, um, you know, we've got really good employee initiatives associated with better hiring and also retention of our staff. That's actually one of our measurable, uh, I'm not an HR, but I, I work with the HR professionals. Like one of our measurement goals is people have to feel like they're growing at hyperproof to actually stay there. And I think that's a recognition that 
people need to grow in their career, but also at the same time, we have to be inclusive towards encouraging people from non-traditional backgrounds to apply to our jobs, um, preferably if they have cats, uh, though we do accept dogs. Uh, a lot of us are cat people, it turns out. And that comes through in a lot of our messaging as well uh, around um, job postings that we have, where we are a fully remote organization that has a uh, fairly strong commitment to diversity. Uh, and that comes through in like as you said, in a lot of the things that you've seen, but also on the back end. Um, we're just now completing our uh, DEI training. And even though we do have business in California, like we went, okay, well, the, the California standard is, that's a good, you know, that's a good footing to start with, but let's go a little bit further. And let's talk about like all the elements associated with DEI rather than just those that are mandated or that we have to do in order to be compliant. And I think that's a great commitment to show as a business that, you know, we care about our employees and we also want to ensure that everyone feels like they've got a a part of the conversation, regardless of their background and regardless of where they're from, they're here now. We're all working on something awesome. No, and no, just no, no, to, no. the reason I, I, that I came to Hyperproof, um, just kind of the, to explain, but what we do um, prior to joining Hyperproof, I was doing executive advisory work for Fortune 500 Global Thousand businesses where companies would pay us six figures. So, you know, figure. 250,000 and up was not an untoward number where I'd actually look at it and we'd do a cybersecurity maturity assessment of that organization based on their deployed controls, based on which frameworks they were following, their regulatory burden. I worked with a great guy, former Air Force, um, used to blow up stuff and then he got into cybersecurity. And yeah, exactly, right? Uh, Derek was a cool guy and he'd do open source intelligence on uh, these companies. And in the course of doing that, we'd ask, like, show us, like, here's a DRL, a document request list or an evidence request list. I would send it to the client and say, send us your policies, your procedures, and we'll evaluate them. The client would inevitably panic because uh, the auditor or the assessor is coming. They'd ask, what are these things? They'd send it back to us. I then have to have associate consultants who I trained, like, here's how you read a policy document, here's how you inspect a procedure document for evidence of effectiveness. And in six short weeks, we could give them a view of how mature their business was six weeks ago for a quarter million dollars. There's no way that scales. Um, that's just crazy town right there. That's like, it, it, it puts an untoward burden on businesses. And so when I uh, when my buddy Matt at Hyperproof said, hey, we're working on solving that, I said, let's do that because that's great. So what we're focused on is the ability for businesses to continuously collect evidence of compliance without like the classic audit team asks the security team, hey, can you send me a screenshot of a PDF of a spreadsheet, please, so that I can like look at it for a, a green checkbox or a red X. Like nobody wants to do that. And it's a computer needs to copy a file to another computer. Why don't we automate that? Why don't we take all that like checklist oriented work that drives so many of us in security and compliance to like, it's the part of the job that none of us like that we all have to do. Why don't we remove that? Why don't we make that something that's automatable, predictable, you can actually focus your time on things that require intuition and creativity and thought processes as opposed to treating people like machines. Uh, and then let's make sure that we can tie that back to risks so we can understand here's how effectively a company is managing their risk portfolio based on the controls that we're now looking at live because we don't have you know people involved in that bit of right. like, let's copy a file and check and see, hey, is it working? Let's do that live and then make business level decisions where you can actually find either cost savings or reallocate staff time to something more productive to defend the business or maybe a, a take on a different regulatory framework. So that's kind of the, the why I joined Hyperproof, but it also speaks a lot about what we do. Like I look at what the best thing I get to do all day is make people happy who don't necessarily have a history of working well together the compliance team and the security team right. traditionally don't like that's not a great it's a contentious relationship and so in our success stories that i love to work with right and love to talk about 
that relationship becomes productive because we, we get into security. If you're in security, you do not get into security to do, deal with the compliance people. And if you get into compliance, you didn't get into compliance to become a project manager to go chase security people. Uh, so if you can remove that barrier, again, it makes it a more productive working relationship, a lot more healthy, and we can focus on things that you know bring us joy in our day, whether it's doing incident response or malware analysis or policy work. No, absolutely. And and what uh, kind of blew my mind about it. So I, I'm i used to working with spreadsheets and uh, really root like, so again, and so Aaron Williams is sitting there with, I think it's called, uh, I don't, I don't want to drop any, any software, but Stig Viewer, I think, I think it's different. Oh, Stig Viewer. Yeah. Very, I wrote, gosh, yeah. Jeez. Oh. Very, it. <laughs> very rigid. I'm not trying to ask people who develop it. None of that. Right. Like, I guess yeah. I didn't want to kind of say the name, but when you say it, it makes people grimace. You're like, oh, yep. <laughs> it's very hard to work with. Right. But so Aaron Williams is going through spreadsheets. Right. Like he's, he's uh, part of the, uh, the, the network team. So he doesn't really want to deal with the assessors when they show up and then the assessors show up and Things have evolved uh, both in the military and outside where a decade ago, assessors came in, broke your stuff, told you you were wrong, walked out the door, <laughs> right? They had no yep. skin in the game. That's what assessors <laughs> did, right? So after doing that for half of, my, half of my life and then going and moving over to the QA side, the inspector general side, things of that nature uh, in the Department of Defense. And now, you know, I do uh, NIST CSFs and uh, things of that nature uh, in the private sector it's a kind of friendlier environment now. So like having this ability to have an interface that allows the two to interact with each other in, a, in a, uh, an easier, friendlier manner just softens the blow even more, right? Because when I come in there to, to come into your business and break your stuff, I, I'm, you know, your assessor, then I turn potentially, you know, into your, your visas and things of that nature. And I can mm -hmm. guide you, right? I have skin in the game. I found the thing that's broken and now I can help you fix the thing as our relationship continues to evolve. And that's what I, that's, that's what I like about the, the software, especially about my, my company, right, as well, uh, is that approach. And it, the military is going that, that route as well, right? Like when I came into QA is when the switch kind of flipped back in the, I'm, I'm going to date myself, uh, I'd say 2010-ish. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. That sounds about right. Is when the military was starting to, because I came in 03, right? So Aaron Williams was getting beat up by assessors. And then when I became an assessor, that's when they decided to flip the switch. <laughs> They're like, well, no, we can't just go in there and break their stuff. <laughs> Get their commander fired, right? Uh, right? We have to come in here and try to help them evolve. And it's good to see that it, the same is happening out here in the outside ro world. And companies like your own uh, are making it also just uh, friendlier and easier to do it, right? So, so even to the extent where I could even say it's, it's kind of gamified, it makes it kind of fun. Uh, to you know, to to get your policy or whatever that that artifact or or proof or evidence is to make the the thing turn green and then make the you know the the, the wheel spins and things of that nature right like you're it's 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 uh, it gives you endorphins. <laughs> it it <laughs> does, and also it, <laughs> it oh exactly. And the thing is, like the reason we have these frameworks, these laws, these regulations is because of risks. And I think the, the biggest thing that companies that are using Hyperproof are able to do right now is to look at emerging risks. Because what I was describing from like, when I was doing executive advisory work, I could tell you your risk profile six weeks ago, right? I've met companies that do a risk assessment on an annualized basis in today's business landscape, and I'm, I'm going to step back and not say cybersecurity landscape here, but in today's business landscape, there are a lot of risks out there. A lot of them are very known risks like international expansion or competition or supply chain disruption, some of which cyber is a factor on. But if you can categorically list those risks, define them, get everybody on the board and see level and executives to agree on these are the risks we're talking about, folks. This is how we feel about them. Here are maybe some numbers associated with them. But then automatically collect data over how effectively you're managing those risks. That means when a new risk comes up, you can more easily ingest it and make an informed decision rather than going, oh, well, geez, we, we can't talk about this for six months. Because I don't think that's an acceptable position for a company to take anymore is to say, we can't talk about today's risks, we're still talking about the risks from last year. I don't yeah. think that that's a way to manage a business effectively. No, I, and, and I like that, the, uh, the, the insight there as well, because it, it shows that the, uh, the, the CISO or whomever, whatever they want to call that position, has a direct impact on uh, business performance, right? And that's, that's, I think, something we don't talk about enough. 
because uh, you have other positions. Like I've, I've heard of BSO and things of that nature where they're trying to bridge the gap. Uh, mm-hmm. But at the end of the day, I think uh, there's that evolution where you're starting to see more of the the, the techie people. In, in your case, like I, I like how your company breaks it down into uh, the three different types of uh, CISO that make the 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 one, you know, uh, 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 greater than the sum of its parts. I think that's the future um, going forward because uh, you have an MBA or you have whatever experience in Fortune five hundreds and things of that nature. Like that, you're not necessarily the the techie person in the room, but you need to know how that's going to impact the bottom line, and that that gap needs to be bridged. So it's it's good to see that this even helps in that regard as well, right? Because you're you're giving them the ability to to see it in real time. So yeah. Yeah, I think that's the other part on the cybersecurity narrative we need to collectively pivot is the narrative that it is a black hole into which money and effort and goodwill go into and the only thing that ever comes out are data breaches. I think that that has been our historic approach of like, this is what cybersecurity is. You try not to have a bad day. Um, I think that it, the smart CISOs these days are partnering with the go-to-market team. They're partnering with the HR team. They're partnering with the governance committee. And they're saying, this is actually a competitive advantage. If you are selling business to business right now, if you're in the SaaS space selling B2B, and you can say, I have a good cybersecurity stance. Maybe you've got some attestations like a SOC 2 type 2. Maybe you've got an ISO 27001, something like that, right? You can skip past a lot of the security questionnaires that your competitors are going to be filling out. And that becomes suddenly a accelerator to closing deals rather than dealing with 1200 question SIGs, standard information gathering questionnaires, which no CISO really likes to deal with. And the sales team, they don't want to deal with that either. Um, I think that becomes it's missing from our conversation around cybersecurity. This actually not only helps defend your customer's data, but also it makes business easier because as we all look at our supply chains, um, we're all asking ourselves, well, who's the risk in my supply chain now? And who can I effectively trust? And so by having that ability to effectively communicate, here's how what we're doing the cybers right now, like it becomes a competitive strategic advantage, which I think is necessary. No, absolutely. So this is a great conversation because I think it spans the the gamut, right? Like we're we're talking uh, to people who are trying to, to break into cyber, kind of understand it, uh, ways that can pass pathways to potentially getting there, uh, and that you can have you can come from a diverse background or have diversity of thought, uh, and and make some really big waves within the industry. But also uh, talking to people who are uh, you know currently in the industry and then different tools and things that they can look at. But most importantly. Uh, it's it's the the talking to the people who are at the top, right? The people who can give the hand up. Like you can bring these people in who have the diversity of thought, diversity of culture, things of that nature, who can give you a different uh, uh, opinion or viewpoint. Like you said, you have a a, a vi- accomplished violinist who is now doing you know great work in, in cyber, um, and these people can be uh, a great asset and help you with the bottom line. Because at the end of the day, it's it's about like from their perspective, it's going to be those shareholders. It's going to be the bottom line because um, that's that's their job, right? That's the function they they provide to the business. Uh, and we provide, uh, at least in my case, uh, I'm the, the person who's feeding you the information to make sure that you're uh, protecting your clientele, staying uh, safe, right? So that way you're not going to get beat up by the government or breach one of your frameworks and then you lose money. So I think it's a, it's a, a very concise conversation. I, I don't think it's it's always broken up a lot um, to sometimes the uh, the detriment to the, uh, to the audience. So that I, I can greatly appreciate that. So I'm going to make a hard pivot. <laughs> <laughs> all right. <laughs> so outside of uh, all the great work that you were doing uh, with, with you and your company, um, what are you doing uh, to relax? Because uh, like uh, ne- next week, so uh, just behind the scenes, uh, we're going through articles now, right? I do the run of show usually on a Friday or a Saturday. Uh, but mm-hmm. there's been so many articles the past couple of days about mental health and cybersecurity. Like, because from the the CISO down, people are just either they're they're overworked, they're overstressed, they're just not getting enough sunshine, right? Uh, and just as part of the job, can sometimes be long hours, uh, and uh, like you said, sometimes you're checking boxes, you think doing things that are are, are uh, uncomfortable or dis displeasing uh, right. on a daily basis, right? So what are you doing? to protect your mental health? Like what do you do to unwind things of that nature outside of work? 
Um, let's see. So uh, I'm, first of all, a, a, a fan of regular exercise, even if I don't necessarily want to do it, or even if my watch tells me occasionally, like, you didn't sleep well enough, maybe you should take it easy today. Um, I do get up and make sure that I get in my exercise, you know, 40 hardcore minutes every day. I've got a, uh, during the pandemic, I found a VR kickboxing app. Uh, with a, just this pair of Australians and they're fantastic, the, the coaches, and that works for me. So, you know, 20 minutes of just sweating. I'm sure that if I had the windows to my living room open, I'd probably look absurd, but that's not the point. Um, and then uh, Bellingham is blessed with a lot of um, outdoor activities we can do when it's not raining here or when it is raining here. So in our secret six weeks of summer, I tend to be a fan of going out and going paddleboarding. I'll go out for eight, 10, 12 miles on the lake, take a picnic, take coffee with me. It's fantastic. In the winter, I've been snowboarding for dear over 30 years now um, I did try skiing once twice actually it didn't work out so I'm, I'm very much into those things and then when I'm not out doing um, athletic stuff um, let's see For some reason I am one of the founders of uh, Bellingham's local board gaming uh, discord server okay. and uh, we regularly run board games so I'll have you know I actually have two board game campaigns that I run right now or I'm on one uh, and I'll usually have like 20 or 30 people over on a Friday, you know, fix punch, we'll play board games for, you know, till midnight, 1 a.m. And uh, the next day I go, oh, that was fun. Yeah, my watch is telling me I didn't sleep well enough. But I find that that's like it, it building something for other people to enjoy and to, you know, experience play. And um, myself, I tend to like math heavy board games, but not everybody does. So I try to have accessible board games. Uh, and then other than that, um, pinball. That's my other thing. A, a big fan of old school pinball. Okay. Like, so, uh, the actual like analog, like I put my hand on, on, uh, Oh yeah. Pinball? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, we are blessed with, um, so sometimes for a date night, my boyfriend and I actually will go to the racket, which has 16 tables, I think in a bar. And, uh, you know, if the kids are in town, we'll take them to, uh, the ruckus room, which has got, uh, old school arcade games like street fighter two and whatnot, as well as oh, maybe a, wow. a dozen okay. pinball tables. So, um, I, I enjoy it. Uh, I find that um, I was in Las Vegas, actually, for Black Hat, and my favorite thing that I went to at Black Hat, other than a couple meetings that I had, was I went to the Pinball Hall of Fame, uh, which I absolutely love, because, you know, it's just like all the old pinball machines that I remember growing up. That's awesome, because I, I don't see that a lot anymore. Like, I know, uh, like you said, you were, you were at Black Hat, so I know, I know Vegas has a bunch of, like, uh, arcade like restaurants and bar themed places that have old school cabinets and things of that nature but i haven't seen one here in tampa yet i'm sure it exists i'm sure there's like like someone like there's the one person from tampa who's listening <laughs> who'll be like yeah it's so and so <laughs> drop like, it in the comments. the comments yeah please yeah, drop yeah. it in the comments i can go there <laughs> uh but yeah so like uh you're you're in the state of washington so i, I know you guys like so I've, I've passed away a few i was stationed in alaska so i used to fly through all the time right uh but I actually uh, was able to stop uh, between, I was, because I, I lived in Idaho, I was stationed in mm -hmm. Idaho, uh, Mountain Home Air Force Base, and then we're stationed at uh, Elmendorf, so in Anchorage. Uh, but when I was, prior to moving there, um, we decided to ship the vehicle, right? We didn't want to drive, like we should have did it. We should have drove the Yukon and saw the, you know, the, the beautiful uh, scenery. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but instead I was like, ah, it's going to be a long trip. The kids are young. Let's just ship it and fly there. So every time I flew through Seattle, pouring rain, right? The one time yep. I dropped off my vehicle, I dropped it off in SeaTac. Uh, I was, the the port was in Seattle, but my hotel was in Tacoma. And I didn't know that, I didn't know any better. So, and so I had to make that, that I had to bridge that drive. gap. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it, no rain, it was beautiful. It was like uh, the scene from Grey's Anatomy. I don't know if you ever watched the, the Grey's Anatomy um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, where they show Seattle and it's not raining. You're like, that doesn't exist. Like every time I go through there, it's raining. But it was it was just like that. I went to, I think it's called Pike's Peak, where they, they throw uh, the fish. A Pike Place Market. But yes, Pike Place uh, Market, where they throw the fish and stuff like that. I saw the uh, the first, uh, I think it was the original Starbucks. At least is what mm -hmm. they told me. Um, which looks nothing like Starbucks now. It was really crazy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I can see them have an arcade scene uh, there. And oh, and I, I, I've been to yakima as well i don't know if you're 
Never been to Yakima. Oh, yeah, been to Yakima. Was, was there through there last summer, actually, on the way to a group of wineries down in Walla Walla. I guess that's the other thing that I do is um, a couple of friends and I, we do regional wine tours once a year, oh, sometimes awesome. twice a year. So this year we went up to Canada, up near Kelowna, and um, hit a bunch of wineries, a couple of distilleries. Uh, it's agritourism, I guess, is what we're supposed to call it. But to us, it's like, oh, good, we get to go drink wine for a week uh, or for a weekend or for four days. So, like, it's, it's just a fantastic thing to do and support local businesses, see a part of the region we wouldn't know normally get to, whether it's in BC or Oregon or Washington State. We might go a little further afield, I think. No, that's awesome. Yeah. Uh, speaking of, of, of drinking, I, 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 I joke to people, I tell them I'm going to yak in Yakima. So <laughs> I got very sick in Yakima. <laughs> I had a really bad night. Um, but what I what I didn't know, like until I got there, I was like, all these camper shows I see all the time or the the, the things on top of people's cars that say Yakima from Yakima. Yeah. I was like, oh, okay, that's pretty cool. Yep. Yeah. I, <laughs> bad night. It, it's it's one of those stories that uh, the people who were there, they, they remind me. <laughs> Remember that time with the Yakima? It was for a uh, uh, sec plus net plus boot camp. Uh, oh, wow. the, the DOD was figuring out 8570 and the requirements to having your uh, your your tier one, tier two. So they didn't right. know what we needed. So they were like, just go down there, attend the boot camp, get your, your site plus your net plus. And uh, I was good every night, except for that one night. <laughs> ah, yeah, those do happen in our industry. Uh, just briefly, I all I can say is I was at a sales kickoff for a startup I was at some years ago in San Jose and I walked into a bar and this sounds like the setup for a joke and it was a former <laughs> Russian FSB officer a oh, former gosh. Navy SEAL and me walk into a bar <clears throat> and they have to prove to, you know to themselves how they how much they can drink and uh you know the former Navy SEAL points at the upper left side of the the, the bar shelves it's just we're gonna work our way across um, that's also where I learned cultural differences, where if you are the person who stops drinking before somebody who's Russian, like classically, you're not going to be their friend. They're going to be insulted by that. Um, oh, on a positive note, I was not painting the sidewalk at 3 a.m. like he was, which that was just something I learned not to do. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, the, I, yes, the, the, in the industry, you do have those stories. I that was younger me. That was that was Airman Williams me, like like forty year old me. That that's not gonna happen. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I would have been I would have been put down way earlier in the night <laughs> than than that. But no, uh, so next time I'm 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 up there, I definitely have to to, to hit hit you up and let you know I'm there in in the area. Oh, definitely, I, I definitely want to see because I don't. I don't get enough of that, right? Like being a, a kid from the eighties, you don't see a lot of arcades any longer. You don't see a lot of uh, pinball, um, I guess halls, uh, what would you call it? Or like uh, a pinball room or a, a pinball mm -hmm. bar. Gotcha. I mean, yeah, so I remember though, the arcades, like the, the arcades were somewhere I could lurk outside of in the hopes of not getting a broken nose for having gone in, uh, which is to say that perhaps I was not in the best of, uh, yeah, <laughs> my childhood was just a, a mess ultimately, but gotcha. now I can go to the arcade, I can spend 50 cents, I can play pinball, it's awesome, plus you can get a drink, uh, yeah. and you know, they've got fairly good music too, so absolutely uh, lo love going there, probably now that I'm talking about it, I'm going to have to go there this week. <laughs> no, they, that's awesome. And then, uh, of course, you're you're not a beer drinker, but you're uh, you're cultured <laughs> because of the, the uh, I, I show. I do like I do like wine, and I am learning beer. Um, uh, we'll see. My friend from uh, he's in aerospace. Actually, is uh, there are two cans left in my fridge uh, that are up for drafting compliance, and he gave me a four pack, sent another four to Tom, and said I was going to hate one of the four of them. We've just done two of them so far. I haven't hated them, although I will say raspberry is like not my favorite beer for, beer flavor. Right. Um, yeah, but required, I'm still waiting to see which is going to be the one that I absolutely hate. So uh, watch drafting compliance in the next month, and we will hopefully find out which one I hate. Right. Right. Yeah, we'll definitely get there. Um, but yeah. So <laughs> I, and and I do I do like wine as well. Like uh, I picked it up in Sicily. I was tasting in Sicily for a while. Oh, beautiful uh, area. Yeah. Like so. Like uh, not only is it the the tours and all the touristy stuff, it's super cheap. But uh, I learned that because um, I, I like uh, bitter, right? So like uh, like bitter beer, or bitter bitter wine, uh, Etna, right? So you're right there mm -hmm. on the volcanic. Uh, uh, what do you say? Surface, like the whole town is on a slant. Uh, but they get their grapes uh, from the uh, from the volcano, 
Uh, mm -hmm. And then every family has their own variant, right? So you stop by a store, you go to a restaurant, like they all have their own wine. Uh, so it grew on me pretty, pretty quick, but they don't use preservatives, obviously. So it gives you the excuse, like I have to drink this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, <laughs> I can't put it in the fridge. It's going to go bad in a couple of days. <laughs> I have to finish this. <laughs> uh, yes, Italy definitely ruined my my expectations for wine. I've just only recently come around to, oh, there's other wines in the world. That's neat. Right, right. <laughs> but no, uh, this has been a, a fascinating conversation, right? Uh, so I, and even though I did have some samples of your work, right, because I, I do watch your podcast, and we'll definitely make sure we put all the links uh, in your bio and description, all that good stuff uh, within this, this episode. And as I share it primarily on LinkedIn, um, we'll make sure to capture all your information. Um, but I, I did not know the background. So that's awesome. And it just goes to show that, uh, there's definitely a need for the diversity of, uh, of thought and culture and things of that nature, uh, when it comes to cybersecurity, because you never know what you'll be able to pull from somebody, right. Um, what they bring to the table, what they can bring into our field, uh, as well as just having a different perspective, like just that in itself helps out tremendously. Um, because like if everybody's the same in the room, right? Like you're not ever going to, to evolve. Uh, and, and that's kind of where cybersecurity, uh, has been for a while now. And it's starting to, to move, uh, in, into, um, what I believe to be a more diverse and, uh, more, um, friendly environment, right? Coming from being an uh -huh. IT guy in engineering, like, uh, IT people kind of rough, <laughs> engineers yeah. rougher <laughs> cyber security has always been a little bit friendlier uh at, at least uh from from my perspective right so i, I think this community is growing is it's it's getting even better so I, I definitely want everybody to tune in to to you and your stuff and all your initiatives so we're going to post post all of that good stuff uh I, I definitely want to have you back on the show uh and you know with your schedule i know you're a pretty busy person but whenever you have the, the free time please let me know my calendar is always open um because i think this is a really good conversation like uh, it is called Ask a CISP, and I, I like to to get uh, uh, as many uh, different opinions and uh, information out there as possible to people who are trying to obtain that. Uh, and hopefully they're trying to grow into it and not just trying to capture the the CISP because the entry-level job is asking for it. <laughs> right? Yeah, no, that, that is a difficult into. piece of paper to get yeah, on your wall. You, you that is it. not easy. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, it, it's not only about studying for the test, it's about having uh, the, the experience uh, and being being within the, uh, the field. So, uh, but no, thank you uh, for, uh, for, for being on the show again. Uh, it's, it's great for you to share your time. And if you have any parting words uh, before we go. Um, yeah, I wanted to thank you for having me on the, time, on, on the show, Ryan. Really do appreciate it. And um, Grafton Compliance, if you like FedRAMP or you want to know more about that, if you're interested in my hot take on the news, that's top five and five. And we're doing a new live stream, too. So um, if you reach out to me on LinkedIn, we Hyperproof has a new live stream called InfoSec Pros, where I am interviewing uh, people who are CISOs, people who are infor information security, cybersecurity practitioners. So if you're interested in being on that, I'm trying to fill up my show calendar for the next oh, yeah. six months. So uh, oh, yeah. drop me a note. Uh, we just had Joe Evangelisto on, a fantastic CISO, a friend of mine, and hopefully that will grow as well. But keep doing what you're doing, Ryan. We really do. Um, I'm a fan of the show. So excited to be on. And uh, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. So yeah, uh, everybody, please continue to uh, to, to tune in. Uh, I, ne I don't do enough of the like, share, subscribe. I always forget. Uh, but definitely like, share, subscribe, hit a bell. There's a bell associated. We're trying to grow our YouTube channel. So please share with your nerdy friends. Uh, so they can also uh, jump on the bandwagon. I would like to double the the uh, current base. We have about 225, uh, uh, something like that, like 500 by the end of the year. So we're still trying to achieve that. But just continue to listen to the show. We, we greatly appreciate everybody and leave your comments. So uh, hit us up at all of the websites that go by our name. You can hit me up personally. I'm at RyRy Security Guy. That's R-Y-R-Y Security Guy. I'm on LinkedIn, Clubhouse, Twitter, and Threads. And yes, I still call it Twitter. And where can they find you? <laughs> It will remain Twitter. I am Kane McGladry on LinkedIn. I am Kane McGladry on Twitter. And uh, if you want to find out about the company, it's hyperproof.io or just hyperproof on LinkedIn or Twitter. There it is. Uh, stay safe. Stay secure.